This episode was brought to you by Brilliant. Hey everybody, it's Anais and I know what you're thinking. Happy Pi Day! But guess what? I'm European and in Europe, and for that matter, in most of the world, we write the dates with the day preceding the month. So by this notation, today is not really Pi Day, and we've already established on this channel that the 22nd of July is a far better approximation of Pi. So if you're in the mood for a maths themed video, feel free to check out the approximate history of Pi for Pi Approximation Day. However, on this Pi Day, I've decided to make a circular argument about how we know enough about circles, and instead we're going to talk about a far more Indian, and of course, European type of pi that no longer exists today. PIE, or Proto-Indo-European language. As I'm sure you're aware, language evolves over time, acquiring new words, forming new dialects, and maybe even going extinct if there aren't enough new speakers to pass it on to the following generations. In a manner very much akin to biological evolution, whereby species are descended from a common ancestor, languages as we know them today have also undergone a similar evolution. For example, speakers of Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, and Catalan may be able to understand each other when speaking, and they can often just about understand texts in the other languages when reading them. This is because they all belong to the Romance language family that is descended from Vulgar Latin. So whilst the meanings, declination, and phonemes have diverged from Latin, they still share many root words in common. Case in point, here's the first line of Don Quixote de la Mancha in nine different Romance languages. En un lugar de la Mancha, de cuyo nombre no quiero acordarme, no ha mucho tiempo que vivía un hidalgo de los de lanza en astillero, adarga antigua, rocín flaco y galgo corredor. You've probably been able to see quite a few similarities and parallelisms in the grammar and the words used, even though some of the translations actually vary quite a bit. Much like a geneticist can sequence the genomes from different species and assess the phylogenetic relationship based on how similar or different their genome is, linguists have compared the similarities and differences between languages to trace back their evolutionary history. For instance, Galician seems to be most similar to Portuguese, but is also more similar to Castilian Spanish than to the other languages, and a similar observation can be made of Catalan and French. When taking into account the regions in which the languages are spoken within Europe, these findings are unsurprising. By contrast, Romanian appears to be the most different, and that is because they have a much greater influence from Baltic and Slavic proto-languages compared to the other languages featured here. From this example, you can see how different languages are related, and one could try to guess what the proto-version of each of these words may have looked like. And as it turns out, it is thought that the Indo-Iranian languages in Asia, and the vast majority of European languages, with the exception of these fine languages, are all derived from a common ancestral language known as Proto-Indo-European, or PIE, or PIE. PIE is estimated to have been spoken during the Late Neolithic to the Early Bronze Age, though depending on which theory you support, the time it was spoken ranges from around 10,000 BC to as recently as 2500 BC. There are obviously no recordings or scriptures dating back to those times, meaning that to reconstruct what words may have existed in PIE and what they may have sounded like is based on healthy speculation, based on comparative studies. This does mean that yes, it is potentially controversial and not everyone is going to be in agreement with each theory, but it's still, in my opinion, a fascinating field. I mean, think about it, how does one go about guessing what an ancestral language's words were and what they might have sounded like? For instance, we can make a good attempt at guessing what words might have been like from the words we have today, much like we did earlier. Here is a very Germanic-centric language tree with a handful of words that are present in Indo-European languages. We have mother, Mutter, Mother, 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 don't be too scared by the mix of superscripts, subscripts, and asterisks on the proto-languages. Whilst I'm not going to go into the precise detail of what each letter represents phonetically, go check the IPA for that, because otherwise this video would be far longer and far more technical than it already is, it is worth mentioning that the asterisk indicates that the word is a reconstruction, and therefore the sounds represented are how linguists hypothesize the sounds were likely made in the mouth, but the exact pronunciation are still unknown. There are actually quite a few more trees like this. We have I, Ik, Yag, Yai, Yog, Yai, Ich, Um, Ash, May, Ego, Ego. We have U, U, Fu, Du, 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 Twum, Tu, 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 Essi, Tu, Dvei, Dvei, Tu, Tvo, Tu, Zwei, Dvo, Do, Do, Duo, Vio. Four. Vier. Fjorder. Vier. Fyra. 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 
Chetasra. Katuria. Kahir. Quatwar. Tessera. Now, from these trees, in addition to similarities in spelling, as was the case with the Quixote text, you might have also noticed similarities and changes across different languages in how the words are said. Many scholars have studied historical phonology to study the correspondence and relationships between sounds in different languages. Friedrich von Schlegel noted that the Latin P and Germanic F corresponded to each other, such as Pisces and Fish, Pater and Father. Rasmin Rask later extended this work to show the correspondence across other consonants and across more Indo-European languages, including Sanskrit and Greek. And then along came Jacob Grimm, who put forth this rule that is now known as Grimm's Law. Which, by the way, this is indeed one of the Grimm brothers from the famous fairy tales. In essence, Grimm's Law explains how certain sounds change from the original PIE cognates to their descendant languages in three main parts. Firstly, Proto-Indo-European voiceless stops change into voiceless fricatives, such as the aforementioned P and F example. For instance, we have cognates conserving the unshifted sound such as Podos Pes Peda Pada And the Germanic shifted cognates such as Fol Fus Fouter Foot Foot We also have words such as Card Quad Kas Ked And the Germanic cognates Vil Vav Va Secondly, Proto-Indo-European voice stops become voiceless stops. This is illustrated, for instance, by words such as Yelandros, Gelu, which have shifted to a voiceless k sound. Kal, Kaldur, Kal. Another example is the shift from D to T, such as with ten. Veka, Je, Dechem, Dashemd, Jesit, T, Tin, T, Tio. One of the rarest shifts is the one from B to P. For example, there's the word Dobos in Lithuanian, which means concave, and has taken on the meaning of deep in Germanic languages. And the B has softened to a P. Deep. Duper. Yep. Finally, Proto-Indo-European aspirated stops become voice stops of fricatives. A good example of this is the shift from sounds like Thermos. Rara. Garma. To Warm. Warmer. Warm. We also have words such as Hien. Answer. Jasis. Hamsa. Whereas in the Germanic languages we have Gos. Gans. Gans. Gais. Gos. Gos. You may have noticed that these form a chain, and they can be represented something like this, or this. Interestingly, you may have also noticed that Lithuanian is one of the languages with the most unshifted cognates. It is typically said that Lithuanian is likely the language that most closely resembles PIE. Now, of course, it's a modern language that has evolved greatly since PIE, but it means that it has more archaic features with regards to its pronunciation compared to other languages. The examples illustrated today are some of many comparative techniques used by linguists to infer what the original cognates of words we use today may have sounded like. And whilst we cannot verify exactly how they were pronounced or said, the IPA symbols used in the words indicate where in the mouth the sounds were thought to be created, even if exact pronunciation may have varied. Which, speaking of which, I think it's time to come full circle. What would a video about reconstructing PIE be without a reconstruction of PIE? Because I really hope you are sticking around to have a slice of pie with me. Sadly, my time machine is faulty and I couldn't travel back to the Neolithic to quench my curiosity. So instead, I consulted with Andrew Bird, Associate Professor of Linguistics at the University of Kentucky, who very kindly translated and voiced a little something into Proto-Indo-European. And can I say, he made it seem as easy as pie. Robium quid with me, yachs to guachas good yes, well, conto dance hodio means dead me. Now, if you felt this video wasn't brilliant enough and you still fancy some maths because deep down you want a finger in every pie, how about you go check out today's sponsor, which is Brilliant! Brilliant is a platform for learning and reinforcing concepts in mathematics and science, so whether you want to learn or practice different concepts in science and maths for school or leisure, Brilliant might just be the platform for you. If you're feeling pious, you might want to check out the Geometry Fundamentals course, which takes your understanding of geometry beyond memorising formulas to solving them through intuition and thinking. Just like learning languages, which requires daily practice, Brilliant can also challenge you and reinforce your learning with daily puzzles and problems in math, logic, engineering and computer science. So if you want to find out more, go to brilliant.org forward slash draw curiosity and sign up for free. And also the first 200 people who visit the link will get a 20% off an annual premium subscription. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Once again, thank you so much to everyone who's helped voice this episode and who helped provide feedback on this video. You might have noticed this video was quite the mammoth to produce, there were over 20 people involved, but hopefully the result was worth it. And of course, if you want to be involved in things like this in the future, make sure you follow me on Twitter, because that's usually where I call out to people. Once again, 
Thank you so much to my amazing patrons on Patreon who have also supported the creation of this content. And I'll see you very soon, this time for real in another video. And as always, thank you so much for watching me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Or should I say, bye.